All right, welcome to the Jono and Huo show. Uh, back for our, what is this? Our second show. Uh, once again with the NBA, we're going to do, be doing NBA restart and playoff preview. Uh, my name is Jonathan Chen. I'm joined uh, again by Kevin Huo. Kevin, how's it going? Not too bad, man. Just uh, happy you have sports to talk about again. How's you? How have you been? Uh, good. Same thing. Too many sports. Uh, too many bubble playoffs to keep track of. But fortunately, the Raptors and Habs play on alternating days, so I am not conflicted at all. Yeah, man. These these ten hours of basketball we're recording on Monday, the eighteenth. So basketball started today. Ten hours of basketball is tiring. Like just starting at ten thirty. Oh. It's uh, six o'clock right now. It's it's pretty wild. Don't forget, football starts in three weeks. Yeah, man. Now that's I mean, by the way, <laughs> basketball will calm down a little bit, but yeah, I mean, this is kind of what we were hoping for, right? This was best case scenario where all the sports were just going to happen all at once, and uh, where I'm going to be super overwhelmed. Well, this is what we were asking for. Uh, well, I guess, uh, let's set at the start. We're doing a uh, restart, I guess, recap of the uh, the bubble games, the seeding games, and then we'll be doing a preview of all the matchups, including uh, the games that happened today. Again, on Monday, the seventeenth, uh, the first uh, games of round one. We have a guest today, new to fantasy six pack, Aaron Gruber, uh, coming in to talk about the uh, the NBA playoffs. Aaron, how's it going? Aaron, you there? Hey, sorry guys, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I think I was on mute. Glad to be on the show. How are y'all doing? Doing good, doing good. What's up? to uh, have some basketball. I've been missing. Needed needed my basketball fix. Well, we're going to be getting that for the next couple months. Uh, well, welcome to uh, John Owen Huel Show, and welcome to Fantasy Six Pack. This is your, uh, your first podcast with the website. How's it feel? I'm super stoked. Somebody, uh, will actually listen to me spout about basketball, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we'll see how many views we get by the end of this. We'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I guess, Aaron, you had an uh, intro you want to go over. Just uh, shout out to the NBA for the uh, for the work they put in on, in the bubble. Yeah, I just uh, I wanted to, to give them a shout out because the bubble environment, I know, has not been super ideal for the players, but they've done a really good job in – First of all, with the COVID cases, having none in the bubble, which is pretty awesome because it would have been terrible to have the NBA bubble start and then have players that we wanted to see play go out, uh, be, you know, being sick, having to go quarantine. So NBA doing a great job, I think, with that. And then the fact that they put together the play-in tournament, this it's been a lot more exciting, I guess, than it has in previous years where you are seeing teams fight for that eighth seed. You know, the the eighth seed in the West has just been hotly contested and um, happy to see the the Trailblazers uh, go, you know, make it. And, but, you know, they, they fought for that because they, they wanted it. And, you know, the, Suns, unfortunately, didn't make it in, but I guess that leads to my next point, which is the play-in tournament and this bubble environment has just uh, been some great experience, I think, for some of these young teams and some of these young players. Uh, I don't know how many people watched watched the Spurs, but they were yeah, they were fighting for it right to the end, and... I think we saw some pretty good stuff from some of their young players. Uh, Derek White in particular, I thought, uh, you know, maybe he's not showing star potential, but he's getting there uh, because he was he was really balling out in the bubble and put together a bunch of really good games. He was averaging great assists and putting up between 16 and 18 points a night while – also, you know, doing that with good efficiency and playing great defense. And I just, I think that's exactly what the Spurs need uh, is right now is some of those young players to step up. And so uh, Derek White, I was just really impressed with him. And then, you know, Lonnie Walker, he was 
great on defense. His offense still a work in progress, but again, just really valuable experience for those couple of guys. And also interesting for the Spurs going small with putting DeMar DeRozan at power forward. And he showed, in my opinion, he showed that, you know, he's still a star because playing at that power forward spot, he was, you know, he still doesn't take threes and doesn't make threes, but still one of the most prolific and accurate mid-range shooters in the NBA. And he was able to get to his spots, take them, make them, and put together a bunch of good games. So I was I was really impressed with the the young Spurs and I guess the older Spurs and Demar Derozan. Yep, but. the Spurs, uh, like you said, the Spurs, the young players showed up. Uh, unfortunately, their uh, fabled playoff streak ended at 22 years, I believe. But uh, like you said, the young players will be able to pull them into the future. Uh, and you also mentioned the Phoenix Suns battling for that eighth spot. Uh, probably, geez, just the story of the bubble. 8-0 eight, uh, eight no in the bubble, uh, still missing the playoffs, uh, losing the tiebreaker, or coming half a game behind. Uh, big story, Devin Booker really showing that he is a superstar, averaging 30 points, 6 assists, and 5 rebounds, uh, just under 34 minutes a game. Kevin, what is the, uh, the fusion look like, looking like in Phoenix? Um, I think it's pretty bright. I mean, they're still going to regret drafting Aiden over Luka. That's pretty obvious to see. But it's not – I think a lot of moves that they kind of got made fun of for, you know, Cam Johnson out of left was, you know, not well panned. Uh, trading TJ Warren, you know, for nothing was not a great move either on paper. But the team that they put together, uh, it kind of works. Um, you know, you've got Aiden as like a role man, Booker as a ball handler or scorer. And then everyone else just spreads out and plays defense. I think it's going to work. The problem is that they're in the West. And there legitimately might be 12 teams next season in the West that are competing for eight playoff spots. So they could win, you know, 43, 44 games next year and still not make the playoffs. So, uh, I mean, it's definitely cool to see. Ain't no Booker blossoming as like a, you know, a playmaker instead of just a shooter. That's incredible. But, um, I don't know. They're, they're, they've got some moves to make, but I, I do like the the direction they're going in. Yeah, like you said, it's good to see that they have that that foundation. You know, that's something to build off for next season. And uh, Monty Williams really showed what he can do with uh, in terms of the coaching there. Uh, I guess moving on to the team that that did make the playoffs, uh, Trailblazers on the back of Damian Lillard winning the uh, Bubble MVP. Uh, 37 points, almost 10 assists, uh, four rebounds, uh, six and two record coming through the very last game uh, against the Brooklyn Nets to get in. Uh, Aaron, what are your uh, thoughts on that? And I guess we'll get we'll be getting into this later, but do they have a chance against the Lakers? I think that it's going to be a tough out for the Lakers, especially with how the Lakers have been shooting in the bubble. They weren't shooting particularly well from three point range, uh, you know, before the shutdown. But then in the bubble, they've just been atrocious from three-point range. Nobody can can hit the three-point shots. And I think that with, <laughs> with the Dame time going and the fact that they have Nurkic back, that's a, a big body to pair up against. I don't know how well he's going to do against Anthony Davis or towards the perimeter, but they kind of have Zach Collins for that, we hope. And... I, I think it's going to be a tough a tough out for the Lakers. Uh, you know, obviously you have LeBron and you have Anthony Davis, uh, two of the top probably five players in the NBA there, and that's going to be a tough matchup for anybody. But I just think that I I don't think it's going to be as easy. I don't think it's going to be a clean sweep. I think the Blazers are going to take at least a couple of games. Uh, simply because Lillard is going to go off for 50 or 60 one night and just take it away from him. Fair enough. Uh, all right, moving on. Kevin, uh, you're talking about the Suns. You mentioned uh, they regret passing up on Luka Doncic. Another team that passed up on Doncic uh, rectified that mistake and the Kings, as the Kings fired uh, Vladdy Divac uh, recently after passing up on Luka Doncic and drafting Marvin Bagley Jr. Uh, a lot of people wanted him fired immediately. Uh, I mean, right after the pick was made. What, what do the Kings do moving forward now uh, to kind of 
fix that the the mediocre and middling roster they've been dealing with for the last couple of years? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. Build around Fox. I, I don't know what else they can do. Um, the problem is that they're kind of stuck in this place where they're pretty good, but like they're not going to be top five in the lottery, so they've got to build through that. But screwing up the Bagley pick really, really hurts. It sets them back a little bit because, uh, I mean, you've got Fox. You know, everyone else is kind of mediocre. Harrison Barnes is probably the most average, you know, near max player in the NBA. Heald is okay. Bogdanovich is a free agent. And then, other than that, they've just got a bunch of average players. So I don't really know how you're going to get better from there. No free agent is going to Sacramento. And uh, I don't know who their new GM is, but I doubt he's going to be confident enough to pull off the final wild trade. So uh, the best bet is that Fox builds into an all star type and then you know, Bagley gets back from injury and they run pick and roll all day and, and see what happens with that. But I don't know. They've got a lot of work to do. Uh, is Buddy Heald a part of that equation moving forward? Um, I think so. I mean, they extended him, right? And I, they were basically choosing between... It seemed like they were choosing between him and Bogdanovich, and it seems like they picked Heald, uh, even though you know Heald lied about his age, which is a weird thing to do. But um, I, I guess Heald is part of the equation. I mean, him and Fox is a pretty interesting combination. They seem to... Like, on paper... Those skill sets seem to match really well. You know, like a point guard who is kind of like a slasher and passer and a shooting guard who shoots. But the problem is that neither of them are very great defensively, especially Heald. He's not a defender at all. And in this day and age, you kind of have to play a little bit of defense on the perimeter. So they've just got a lot of holes that I'm not really sure how they're going to fill. They do need a new coach. I don't think Luke Wallen's cut out for it. And, uh, yeah, obviously got to find a GM first, too. For sure. And, uh, well, I guess we'll leave this to our resident Bulls fan, but the Chicago Bulls finally fired Jim Boylan. Uh, Aaron, how is this? Uh, I guess you're already jumping for joy in uh, as a Bulls fan, but what, I guess, how does this help? Any? Do you have any candidates in mind for the Bulls? And uh, I guess who benefits most on that team other than Laurie Markkinen? I think, well, first of all, I'm super stoked that they fired Jim Boylan because uh, that was a nightmare. But... Uh, my, I guess the candidate I'm most interested in is Kenny Atkinson. And I know he's he's one of the guys they're looking to interview. And they said that they don't even have a, li- uh, a number of people that they're going to interview. So I'm sure that they're going to have lots of them and pick who they want. But Kenny Atkinson, to me, just has a proven track record with young players and their development. Uh, you know, he took Spencer Dinwiddie, who uh, conveniently came from the Bulls, and he's he puts up borderline star numbers uh, most nights. And same thing with Karis LeVert. Karis LeVert, uh, you know, when he's healthy, puts up some really solid numbers. And, you know, Kenny Atkinson developed those guys. So he's my uh, he's my favorite coaching pick, but I know that there's some other ones out there that um, – AK and Mark Eversley have their eye on and have previous relationships with. And there's a lot of good coaches out there, you know, some assistants and current head coaches uh, seem to be less, but assistant coaches, it seems to be a lot of them. So um, they seem to have been deliberate with the, with the search and deliberate with evaluating Boylan before they, let him go, which I think is a good sign for the Bulls organization moving forward, given that they uh, have really blacklisted themselves in the past for hiring and firing and not letting coaches have any sort of freedom or any time to actually be evaluated on what they do before they kick him out the door. So that's good for the organization. I think that a new coach is going to benefit the players. Uh, especially Larry Markkinen. Uh, he was good. Uh, he was very good in his rookie season, and he was good in his sophomore season. And then this year, he just took a nosedive because of the number of shots that he was taking. He was taking, uh, before the shutdown, he was taking a third of his shots um, right above the key, and he was the lowest percentage shooter from that area in the entire NBA. So that says a lot about 
plays that were being called for him. So I'm hoping that we'll find a coach that will work well with Zach Levine uh, because he's been doing well driving the basketball and shooting his threes and just the rest of the pieces fitting together and seeing who we draft as well. So I'm pretty stoked that they fired Boylan and I think the future's bright there for the Bulls and for those young players. And I know a lot of the a lot of the players on the Bulls team are going to be pretty happy about that that firing and will benefit from a new coach. All right. Hope renewed in Chicago. Uh, well, that's does it for the, I guess, the biggest news uh, from the bubble other than Lou Williams, but we're, we won't touch that on the show today. Uh, let's move on to our uh, playoff previews. Uh, we'll start in the East uh, with the number one overall seed Milwaukee Bucks against the eight seed Orlando Magic. Uh, Kevin, I mean, I don't think this is going to be a super long discussion with these two teams, but... Is anybody on the Magic gonna stop Giannis from running from running them over? Realistically, no. Giannis is gonna do. He's gonna do the thing where he scores thirty six points in like twenty eight minutes and then just sits on the bench all fourth quarter. Um, yeah, I'm not really banking on much. The Magic are a good team. Um, they don't have a lot of stars, but they have a lot of decent players. They're gonna make it tough, but uh, honestly, they just don't have enough rim protection. So, like Bamba hasn't really worked out at all. And Vucevic is not a rim protector at all. So Giannis is kind of just going to go wild. And uh, yeah, I'm not, again, I'm predicting a sweep here. We can get into that later, but it's it's not going to go well. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, with, if if Jonathan Isaac wasn't hurt, does th- does he give the Magic anything else for the Bucks, Or would it have been, you know, the same, the same destruction, but mm, a little bit more drawn out? I still think uh, maybe... His defense would have won him a game, but they just, they absolutely don't have any tools to stop Giannis. There's a lot of teams in the NBA that can form the Magic, the, I'm sorry, the Giannis wall that they formed in last year's playoffs, but the Magic are absolutely not one of them. And it's like he was saying, the, you know, Vucevic is not a rim protector, even though he's a good player. And I just don't think Jonathan Isaac could slow down. Giannis. Yeah. It, the, then the Magic just don't have... I mean, the Bucks. their one weakness is that they give up a lot of threes. They were uh, they give up the most threes. Uh, they were last in threes allowed during the regular season. But Orlando just doesn't have the shooters to take advantage. They're 25th in three-point percentage. And especially with, you know, Aminu out, Aaron Gordon's hurt. Like I said, Isaac's out. Uh, they don't have the personnel to, to be able to do this. Uh, predictions... Bucks and four, and I don't think any game is going to be particularly close. Yeah, Bucks and four. Um, yeah, they might give them a good game here or there when my boy Markel Fultz does something, or Aaron Gordon, Bay Area native. But, uh, no, nah, it's, it's, it's really not going to play. Bucks and four. Take it this back. Aaron, you going to complete the Bucks and four here? Oh, yeah, definitely Bucks and four. I think Aaron Gordon is going to have a good, good game here or there and make it a little bit tough on him, but I agree that it's going to be a lot of Giannis playing the first three quarters and then sitting the rest of the game. All right. Uh, that's Bucks and four for everybody, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, moving on to the second seed, Raptors against the seven seed, Nets. Uh, game one happened this afternoon. Uh, Raptors won the game, uh, their second game one win ever in franchise history. They're now two and ten in game ones, which is excellent. Uh, they won the game 134 to 110. Uh, as most predicted, the, the Brooklyn defense just... Not good. Uh, too many young players that just don't. The defense isn't there yet. Uh, the basketball IQ is not really there yet, and there wasn't really much they could do to stop the Raptors' offense, even in the half court where it tends to struggle. Um, uh, Aaron, did you happen to catch the game? And what were your thoughts on particularly the Raptors' defense still allowing one ten uh, to the Nets despite you know all the injuries that they've suffered? I the. The Raptors always seem to be next man up, and they just they put together a good a good game. Uh, there were you know a couple players that you expected to have better shooting nights. Uh, I know that Kyle Lowry was off, his shot was off, and but it it didn't matter because uh, Kyle Lowry 2.0 came in and 
dropped eight to ten from three. They just and um, Serge Ibaka, you know, dropping a bunch of points on them too. They just it seems like every game they're going to have a different guy who's going to drop a bunch of points on you. And against this Nets team, uh, they just don't have anybody. You know, they've played with a lot of heart, obviously through the bubble and done a lot better than I think anybody predicted. But Raptors are just going to keep rolling rolling through them. Yep. Aaron, you mentioned 8 for 10 uh, threes. That's Fred Van Vliet uh, scoring a playoff career high 30 points to go along with 11 assists. As you said, 8 of 10 from 3. Kevin, you uh, you mentioned it to me during the game, some uh, some PTSD there from the uh, from last season's finals. How far does uh, this well does Fred continue playing like this, and how far can uh, can he take the Raptors? Yeah, no, I'm sick. Um, <laughs> uh, watching him shoot, these, I hate this guy, man. Uh, in case you guys didn't know, I'm a Warriors fan, and Fred Van Vliet just tore my heart out last year, just because like Kawhi, you expect him to do it, Lowry, you kind of expect it, but Fred Van Vliet, like. <sighs> Anyways, um, I don't know. The, yeah, like he's gonna. I, I guess this is just what he is now. You know, he's gonna be. I think he might get close to a max contract in free agency. I really don't see why not. He's you know a point guard who can shoot, who can defend, who can take it off the dribble. He doesn't. He's never been hurt. Like that's pretty much all you can ask for. You can't really ask for much more in a, in a point guard. So, I mean, I really think he's a good player. Uh, how far is he going to take the Raptors? I'm not really sure. I wanted to see more from Siakam this game. Um, but, uh, I mean, I guess we didn't really need it since the Nets are basically a JV roster right now. Yeah, the roster of Karis LeVert and G-Leaguers is not really... Oh, 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 come on. Joe Harris is good. Okay, I forgot about Joe Harris. That's that's my bad. Joe Harris is good. And Jared Allen, I kind of like. But otherwise, you know, Tyler Johnson is there, which automatically brings down your entire roster, but... That's yeah, they have a bunch of guys who I was looking at like, oh, wow, he's on the – oh, Tyson Lawal Cabaret? I remember him when he was on the Sixers. Like, I was just looking at it like, what is going on? Yeah, I mean, Lawal Cabaret scored 26 today on 70% shooting, and they still lost by 24, so I don't really have hope for the rest of the series. <laughs> um, I mean, to be honest, if you, it's not even their fault. Like, if you just looked at the people who like, opted out, like, obviously, Katie and the Kyrie are out. DeAndre Jordan opted out. Spencer Bitcoin didn't with out opted out. Jordan Prince opted out. Wilson Chandler opted out, and then Jamal Crawford, who, you know, 39-year-old hamstring got hurt, uh, couldn't play either. So, uh, yeah, not not too much hope for the for the Nets in this one. Nope. Uh, once again, wraps in four. Another sweep. Uh, four. Yep. Aaron? Oh, yeah, wraps in four. Yeah, right. So that's, uh, once again, all wraps in four. Moving on, uh, another game that was played today, the three the third seed Celtics against the six seed 76ers. Uh, of course, the big injury on this uh, in this series is Ben Simmons out for the rest of the playoffs with a knee injury. Basically boils down to this series, uh, Joel Embiid versus the Sixers. And today's game didn't go as you'd think. Uh, Aaron, we talked about this before we started, but in a game where you're relying on your star, Joel Embiid, to kind of carry you, uh, the Sixers had three other players take more shots. Uh, Alec Burks, uh, Josh Richardson, and Tobias Harris all had more shot attempts than Embiid. Clearly, this isn't a recipe for success, right? And well, how do you think that the Sixers need to kind of need to fix things other than give Embiid more shots to have a chance in this series? I, th- I think you just said it. I think Embiid has to have more shots. However, you have to get him the ball. He's their only chance at winning any of these games. I mean, he has a size advantage on everybody on the Celtics roster minus Enos Cantor, but Enos Cantor is not known for being a fantastic defender. And so the fact that Embiid took, I think, 14 shots and Alec Burks took more than that, that's absolutely unacceptable. And I don't know, I don't care how you get Embiid the ball, and I don't care if he takes 40 shots. He probably needs to take 40 shots for them to have a chance in the series with Ben Simmons out and uh, the fact that Al Horford is just does not seem to be the right fit. I mean, I still, I still think Al Horford is a good, valuable player. I just don't know about his fit on this roster. And 
uh, as we were, again, the three of us were watching before we started, uh, toward the end of the game, Gordon Hayward uh, looked like he sprained his ankle. Kevin, is the, is uh, if Hayward misses time, is it going to have a big effect on the rest of the series? On the rest of the series, not necessarily. I don't think they need Hayward to beat the Sixers team. The Sixers are just not not deep enough. They're not talented enough on the wing to really get it done, in my opinion. But I think if the Celtics want to go further in the playoffs, I mean, I know they for sure have finals aspirations. If they run into the Bucks, they need Gordon Hayward out there as you know a secondary tertiary playmaker. So, you know, we hope it's not that bad. He's getting an MRI. Um, feel bad for the man, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. Hopefully he gets, he gets back healthy. Yep, and of course, uh, I guess without Simmons, a lot of people are expecting the series to be, I guess, a little bit more of a blow-up. But the game was close right up into the end. Uh, ended 101-109 for the Celtics. Um, is there any p- player in particular, Aaron, that do you think needs to step up for the Sixers to... To kind of well, you mentioned Al Horford already, but outside of Horford, anybody else that needs to step up to make this a series for the Sixers? I think Tobias Harris. He's the only the only player on their team besides Embiid that can put up shots. Um, I think he needs to stop taking so many mid range jumpers and focus more on threes and getting to the line. But I really don't see this being much of a series. They just they like you both were saying they don't have any perimeter talent and I know Alec Burks had you know plenty of points and plenty of shots this game but he's not necessarily consistent uh Richardson is a good player uh is he going to give you you know 50 percent shooting from three every night probably not and so I think Richardson has to step up and but at the end of the day and has got to get the ball more he's got to take more than 14 shots a game all yeah. right and your, your prediction Sorry, so, Kevin, go ahead. I saw a tweet from John Hollinger. Uh, Embiid received one pass from a teammate from 5.53 to 16 seconds left in fourth quarter. Good Lord. Not the recipe for success. Uh, all right, Kevin, I guess give us your prediction, then Aaron, you can give it after. Yeah, I, I think um, I wanted to say Celtics in six, but then I found myself agreeing with you too much. So I'm going with Celtics in seven. Uh, I feel like these type, their, their series always tend to kind of get dragged out and you know, longer than what we expect. So I'm going Celtics in seven, but um, I don't. I think it's going to be one of those things where each game isn't necessarily, or the series is in seven, but it's not that close. I don't know if that makes sense, but hopefully you know what I mean. I got you, Aaron. What do you think? I've got Celtics in six. I think that 76ers are going to have a couple. Of- Hot games. Um, there's going to obviously be games where Embiid's taking more shots, and he has the ability to put up, you know, 40 and 20 uh, whenever he feels like it, as long as somebody gets him the ball. But I don't think that they're going to pull out more than two games in the series. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think Celtics and six. Uh, Kevin, like you said, I think the the games could be kind of close, like they'll draw it out. But I think the Celtics have too much depth, and they'll wear down the Sixers. And late in the series, I think you're going to see a lot more. Uh, a lot more, I guess, separation in the score uh, as the series goes on. Uh, moving on to the last series in the East, uh, we've got the fourth-seeded Heat against the fifth-seeded Indiana Pacers. Uh, is this series going to be about Jimmy Butler uh, versus TJ Warren and their uh, and their rivalry, despite what uh, Butler said about it being over, Kevin? Uh, I think it's going to go kind of like how that rivalry is gone, where Warren is going to kind of put up a fight, but Jimmy Butler is going to win it much like the Heat are going to win the series, you know, even though the Pacers might put up a bit of a fight. Um, I think this pace, I think this Heat team is actually really talented. Uh, a four seed, um, but, you know, I think they're I think they're deserving of the four seed. Meanwhile, the Pacers were a five seed all season, but, you know, they're, they're missing, are they missing Sabonis? They yep, missing, Sabonis' foot, he's out, he's out indefinitely. Right, Sabonis is out, and Depot is not 100% yet. Like, it's very clear he's not 100%. So I, I think they're not exactly, you know, the team that they were in the regular season. I think that he can take advantage of that. Um, and, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think it's going to, like, really matter. Like, TJ Warren might score 30 a game. I doubt it. But I don't think that's going to be enough to be picky. And, Aaron, the Heat have announced that uh, Goran Dragic is going to start uh, be in the starting lineup for Game 1 over Kendrick Nunn. Uh, does his veteran presence and, I guess... 
offset the lack of defense he's going to bring, especially against the backcourt heavy Pacers? I, I'm not particularly thrilled with his start. I think since he's been coming off the bench this season, he's been fantastic. But as a starter, I haven't been impressed with his numbers. And um, so I don't, I don't think that the veteran presence is going to make much of a difference. And I have a feeling he's going to be back on the bench after a couple of games. And they're either going to have, you know, Kendrick Nunn starting uh, or, I don't know, maybe even Tyler Hero. And uh, I guess give us your prediction for the series. I think Heat in seven, just because I think that Miles Turner is going to give him a couple tough games. Uh, He's going to have a game where he's going to block four or five shots and make it really difficult on them. And given that Jimmy Butler this season has not even looked at three-point shots, uh, the fact that there's a seven-foot, 260 pound guy waiting there to to block his shot i think is going to make it a little bit tougher on him so i think that the pacers are going to take take some of those games and push it but ultimately i think heat in seven yeah uh i have heat in seven as well i think uh, as tj warren showed early in the in the bubble like he has that ability to just score and i think he'll get or help uh the pacers win a couple of games i think depot Healthy or not, I think the backcourt there is good enough to help, especially against the defensively challenged uh, Heat backcourt with Dragic and uh, Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero not not super great on the defensive end. Uh, I think there's a couple wins in there, so I think Heat uh, will win the series, but the Pacers have enough talent to drag it out to seven. Uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I've got Heat in six. Um, pretty similar reasoning to all you guys. I just think the Heat are a little bit better than the Pacers. Um I think Jimmy is the best player in that series by far. And I think that will kind of, and he, you know, he's, he's a clutch player, especially when it comes to playoff time. Uh, I think he's going to be the difference in a couple games. All right. So everybody's got the heat as well. So no, uh, no dissenting opinions so far. Everybody's got the uh, bunch of teams, but I guess that's not super surprising for a, uh, for an NBA first round. Uh, anyways, moving on to the Western conference with likely the most talked about series. Uh, the Lakers, number one seed against the uh, the Blazers, number eight seed, just got the play in. Uh, Lakers struggled in the in the bubble. Uh, they didn't shoot very well, as Aaron mentioned early in the show. Um, I guess with Avery Bradley opting out and Rajon Rondo hurt, uh, Aaron, who on the Lakers team is guarding Damian Lillard? And I mean, yeah, I guess who's gonna who's who's gonna do that, and who's gonna be the the poor soul to get fifty dropped on them every night? I think that LeBron is probably going to be on Dane most of the series because, I mean, the key to them, the key to the Lakers winning is not letting Damian Lillard go off for 50 or 60, 61, however many points he feels like going off for that night. But I think uh, reminiscent of LeBron, uh, this was many years ago, but when LeBron was guarding Derrick Rose, Derrick Rose was putting up great numbers in the series right up until LeBron got put on him and the numbers fell from there. So I think that they're going to put LeBron on Damian Lillard and let CJ do what CJ does. I think they'd be more happy with CJ McCollum dropping 25 to 30 on them and just living with that than having uh, Damian Lillard just, you know, drop 60 on them whenever he feels like it. So I, and I, to be honest with you, I don't think that Rondo really moves the needle for them all that much. I know he's uh, he's a seasoned vet, and playoff Rondo is a real thing, but I don't see him moving the needle for them much. And Avery Bradley, uh, his shooting and defense obviously are valuable, but his three-point shooting seems to be streaky to me. It seems to have been this season. Uh, so I think, end of the day, they're putting LeBron on Damian Lillard, and hoping to lock him down and then letting the rest of the trailblazers go off. Well, now if Danny green is on CJ McCollum, that he's not going off. Danny green can go over 55, but his defense will stand up that they'll be fine I, on that end. I will not argue with you there. That <laughs> guy is even when his three and three point shot is not falling. He, uh, he is a lockdown defender. So I agree with you wholeheartedly there. 
Uh, all right, Kevin, on the on the other side of that coin, uh, are the Blazers putting Melo on LeBron, or how, how are they gonna how are they gonna pull that one off? So I was listening to a podcast the other day, and they were talking about this series, and they said uh, the exact same question. They said, "Who's guarding LeBron?" And one of the guys said, "I think they have to give Zach Collins a chance." Oh boy. When I turned in my you know my bet for Lakers to win the series, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. Melo's not going to get it done for sure. He can't guard anyone, really. Uh, even he, even though he's skinny Melo, uh, he, I don't think that's going to work out. Yeah, their loss of Trevor Ariza really hurts this game. I guess they could try Gary Trent, but he's a little small. And Zach Collins is probably too slow. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen with LeBron. I'm sure he's just going to turn in crazy performance after crazy performance. But his jumper kind of seems to have abandoned him in the bubble. Um, so And I think they, like you guys have been saying, they haven't really played that well. So I think there's a chance that the Blazers can get a game or two off. Of it. Yep. Uh, I guess give us your prediction for the series then. Yeah, I've got, like I said, Blazers. I think they're going to get a couple games. I think Blazers in six. Uh, I think Dame is just on another level right now. And I don't, while I agree, I see what you mean by LeBron locking him up. I just, I don't see LeBron having the energy to chase Dame Lillard around and play. I mean, Dame has like a 38% usage rate. LeBron, I don't think can guard him for that long at his age uh so i think there's gonna be a game or two where dame goes nuts and and they pull it out on top of that the lakers aren't playing well they might need to you know they might drop one of the first two games just you know because they're not shooting well or something like that meanwhile the blazers played like seven games in 11 days or something crazy so uh it could be a rust versus rest type thing and i'm pretty I, i'm pretty confident the blazers will get at least one maybe two games and aaron your, your prediction I think Lakers in five, um, as much as I don't want to see LeBron win another ring, and as much as I want to see Damian Lillard drop 61, um, I just don't think that they have anything to slow down LeBron James. And you said his jumper has you know, largely abandoned him, but the guy still can bulldog into the lane against anybody in the NBA. And so if he just does that, run a pick and roll and let him run to the rim every single time. And there's no way that Zach Collins stops it. And I, so I think, I think the Blazers are going to pull out a game, maybe two games, but I'm going Lakers in five. Yep. I agree with you. Once again, uh, Lakers in five, I think the X factor of Anthony Davis being probably the best player in this series, uh, just overall, with like LeBron's his age and you know being the more playmaker now, uh, Yusuf Nurkic he's a good player. He's been playing well since he came back from injury. But Anthony Davis is just a better player. I think that X factor is going to really carry the Lakers, even if LeBron's shooting doesn't really come back. Um, like he's like you both you guys said, uh, Lillard is probably going to go off for sixty. I assume in one game, uh, Blazers will win. But other than that, I think the Lakers take the series pretty handily. So everybody's Lakers here. Uh, moving to the other side of, uh, well, I guess the other side of the Staples Center, uh, second seed Clippers against the seven seed Mavericks, which is going on right now. Um, biggest storyline, I guess, can Luka Doncic win a series by himself, basically? Kevin, your thoughts? Well, I mean, to be fair, he's not by himself. I think Porzingis is playing really well, averaging 30 in the bubble. But uh, it's true, this team is definitely not as talented as the Clippers. The question is... Not necessarily if he can win by himself, but in his first playoffs, can he really step up and be the same player that he was in the regular season? We sometimes see that players who kind of generate these kind of numbers, uh, they don't really translate into regulars into the playoffs. So, I mean, especially, it's going to be a big test for Luka, especially since pretty much on every single possession, he's going to be guarded by either Paul George, Kawhi, or even sometimes Patrick Beverly. Um, the game, you know, we're watching it right now, or I've got it on second screen right now. Luka had five turnovers in the first corner. Uh, in the first quarter, that game started 18 to 3, but they've calmed down. It's 38 36 right now. So um, it's going to be a test for Luca, but I think um, that offense is actually like, I, I think it's historically, like numerically, the number one rated offense of all time, which is pretty ridiculous when you consider. I mean, it's Luca, Porzingis, and then a bunch of shooters. So um, it, it's going to be an interesting matchup. I think they're going to be a little tougher than most people think. Uh, yep, and Aaron, uh, like Kevin mentioned, uh, Luca is going to be guarded by Kawhi, Paul George, or like sometimes Patrick Beverly. 
Uh, during the regular season, the Clippers took the season series 3-0 and held Luka to 27% shooting. Uh, do you see Luka being able to break this, or is this going to have to be uh, Porzingis and Shooters series for the Mavs to take this? I I don't think uh, Luka can do it. Uh, I, I absolutely love his game. Uh, I think he's fantastic. Uh, but when you have Paul George and Kawhi Leonard on you, for every single possession of the game, and then Patrick Beverly uh, just overall being a defensive pest. He's prob- I'm sure he's going to be on it for the minutes that Paul George and Kawhi Leonard aren't. Uh, I think that Luke is going to put up his numbers. He's going to get his assists. He's going to get his rebounds. Uh, he's going to have some good games. I know he's uh, just watching the game right now. I think he's played 11 or 12 minutes. Uh, he already has 13 points, but he has six turnovers and with the claw guarding you i think that's bound to happen and then when you just have paul george locking you up uh he's just those guys are too long too big too strong to for the mavericks to really be able to to pull this out yep uh like both you guys said uh, i think Luke's going to have a tough time against those two defenders. Uh, Porzingis is really the key here. Um, if he can play like he did prior to the LC- ACL tear, uh, just up his minutes, be more consistent with the shot and better defensively, I think Mavs have, I guess, a very outside chance. But uh, my prediction, uh, Clippers and six, I think the Clippers are just too uh, well-rounded and have too much star power up top um, that can score and stop Luka. And they'll take it in six, I think. Uh, Kevin, what's your prediction? Yeah, I've got the same Clippers in six. Um, at the end of the day, I think their top two is just too talented. And, you know, while the Mavs might get a game or two because of the brilliance of Luka and Porzingis and, you know, just that offense is probably going to go off for a game or two. Uh, in the end, I think the Clippers will take it. Aaron? I've got Clippers in seven. Um, I just think that the offense is too good. Um, the fact that they have so many shooters around Luca, he draws so much attention. Porzingis draws so much attention, and you know, there's so many guys on this, the team. You know, Seth Curry, DeLon Wright, uh, that Max Kleber, those guys, Tim Hardaway Jr. Those guys just drain open triples, um, and I think that that's going to to win them at least at least three games. And I think that. Luca's going to still, he, you know, he may have uh, a quadruple double here with uh, with turnovers <laughs> for some of these games, but I still think that he's going to give him some medicine. Uh, he's just he's just too good, and so I think that he's going to be able to him and Porzingis with their shooting around them. I think are going to be able to pull out three, but ultimately I think the Clippers just have way too much depth. And then the fact that you have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, uh, there's I just don't see you getting past that. All right, so again, everybody has the Clippers over the Mavs in this series. Uh, moving on to the three-seed uh, Nuggets against the six-seed Utah Jazz. Uh, the most Thus far, the most exciting game of uh, day one of the 2020 NBA playoffs. Uh, Nuggets pulled out a thriller. Uh, despite Donovan Mitchell scoring 57 points, uh, Nuggets won 135-125 in OT. Uh, Jamal Murray came through in overtime, ended up scoring 35 points, I believe. Um, despite missing Gary Harris and Will Barton, uh, the Nuggets won the game. Kevin, do you see... Is this a sign of things to come with the Nuggets just being able to outscore Donovan Mitchell uh, for, throughout the rest of the series? Yeah, I mean... I think the problem with the Jazz now that they lost Bogdanovich and Conley's out for you know, undetermined amount of time is that Mitchell is essentially their only playmaker on the on the uh, on the perimeter. I guess Joe Ingles is there, but I mean he can't be your second best you know offensive creator in a series. Um, at the end of the day, I think with the emergence of Michael Porter Jr., I think the Denver Nuggets ceiling has just raised to a point that the Jazz aren't really going to. And Aaron, there was a toward the end of the game. Uh, the the Jazz had Joe Ingles on Jamal Murray for much of the late stages of the game, despite him looking very obviously fatigued and much too slow for Murray. 
where do you see the Jazz making adjustments there, and who else can they put on Murray to kind of slow him down? <laughs> that's really a good question, and I think that that's going to be the difference in the series. Uh, I don't think that there's anybody that they can put on Murray, and I think the only thing that's going to slow down Jamal Murray is going to be Jamal Murray. Uh, you know, he put up 13 for 20 tonight with six for nine from deep, 36 points. Um, Joe Ingles is, uh, I love Jingles, but he's not a fantastic defender. So I think that the only, only thing that's going to beat Jamal Murray is Jamal Murray himself. So he just, he tends to be streaky. Uh, he'll have a game where he, you know, shoots five for 20, but then the next game he goes and shoots 15 for 20. So, uh, but honestly, I don't see that. Uh, I don't see him having a bad shooting night, uh, losing a game for the Nuggets because uh, they just have a ton of good players. I'm really fond of uh, Grant. I think he's come a long, long, long way. And he's draining three balls and uh, just playing lockdown defense. And then obviously we have Michael Porter Jr., who today didn't shoot all that great. Uh, He was good from three. But he grabbed eight rebounds um, and swatted another shot. So uh, I I don't think anybody uh, stops Jamal Murray. And I don't know what the Jazz are going to do in this series, unfortunately. Yeah, like I I agree with that statement. It's uh, like I said, what else can they do? Uh, Donovan Mitchell scored 57 points, had nine rebounds, seven assists on 58% shooting, uh, and they still lost in they still lost in overtime. Uh, the Nuggets just a lot of firepower. Uh, like I said, with the emergence of Michael Porter Jr., uh, even without Gary Harris and Will Barton there, uh, none of the the Jazz had a particularly bad game. Uh, I mean. The two players in the starting lineup right now, Royce O'Neal and Jawan Morgan, are not really who you want for a, a playoff lineup playing t- 31 and 25 minutes uh, as your, two, of your, two of the three members of your starting front court. Um, I think I don't think the Nuggets are going to shoot 52% uh, for the rest of the series, so I think the Jazz do have some opportunities to, uh, to win a couple of games, but I think my prediction, I had Nuggets in seven, I'm still going to hold out. I'm going to stick 2 7 because I think the Jazz defensively, they can pull out a few games. And uh, Aaron, like you said, Murray could get, you know, streaky, shoot 5 for 20 and maybe lose them a game. But I think the Nuggets still end up pulling this out, you know. Um, they won today and we nobody mentioned Jokic casually putting up 29 and 10. So I think this is uh, too much on Denver to uh, for Utah to stop there. Nuggets in 7. Uh, Kevin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I've got the same Nuggets in seven. Uh, I think these two teams are actually pretty close, although um, I was hoping that the Jazz would have Conley. Uh, I don't think it would have changed my pick, but I do think it makes them more competitive. Like you said, Conley would have been able to guard Murray. Right now they've got, like, I don't know, what are they going to do, put Jordan Clarkson on him? Like, that's not going to work out. So um, Murray is going to be the key in this game, and we are ta- and we haven't even really – Talk too much about Michael Porter Jr., who was averaging like 24 in the bubble, but he only had 13 points this game. So the Denver ceiling is a little like we were talking about the Jazz. You know they could do better, but you know the, the Nuggets could still go do better. And this this is a game they won by 10, where the Jazz had a player who scored 57 points. Like you can't do much better than that. So I am a little bit worried about the Jazz. They just don't look like they have enough perimeter creation, um, and Gobert is not that much of a factor since Jokic can kind of just step out and do whatever he wants. Uh, it's a, it's an interesting matchup, I don't know, but I think I had Nuggets in seven. I'm tempted to go Nuggets in six, maybe even five now, but uh, I'll stick with Nuggets in seven because I'm a man of honor. Fair enough. Uh, Aaron, what's your prediction for the series? With um, Mike Conley out, I've uh, before he was out, uh, I would have said Nuggets in seven, but I've got Nuggets in six. Uh, I just think that the Jazz, the fact that they're starting Royce O'Neal and Morgan uh, is not ideal, obviously, to say the least, to be diplomatic about it. And they don't have any other perimeter creator besides Donovan Mitchell. And while he had a fantastic game, obviously, 
today, 57 points, which they still lost. He's not going to go for 57 points every night. Um, so I'm taking Nuggets and six. All right. Once again, we all agree on the winner of the series. So our last series to see if there's any uh, any dissension here. Uh, Houston Rockets, fourth seed against fifth seed Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, what I've dubbed the narrative bowl. Uh, there's too many stories in this one to pass up. Uh, Chris Paul against the team that said he wasn't good enough to win with. Uh, Westbrook returning to the team that you know brought him up, made him a superstar. And, you know, Harden, hate, everybody hates Harden, and Harden hates everybody else. So that's a nice story there, back uh, against OKC. Big story right now is that Russell Westbrook is slated to miss, uh, quote, a few games of the series. Don't They haven't given a solid timetable uh, on how many he'll miss. Kevin, with him out, uh, can Harden carry the load uh, for the Rockets and win enough games until he comes back? Um, I think he'll have to. I mean, he's used to it. I don't think this is much different for him. He might actually even prefer playing this way, where it's just going to be him and four dudes standing and waiting to catch the ball. Um, I'm not sure. I, like, I think – I don't think the Thunder really have anyone who can guard Harden for 48 minutes, uh, especially if he's just going to – if he has a step-back jumper going, like, it's going to be trouble. Um, so while I think the Thunder are a really well-coached team and they're really well-run, obviously, because – probably Chris Paul. Um, they just don't have that much talent. And at the end of the day, I think the Rockets will kind of just overwhelm them with their their top-end talent If once Russell comes back, but they're shooting overall. And uh, Aaron, on the on the Thunder side, as Kevin mentioned, with, with Chris Paul there running the offense, um, can he, I guess, slow down the game and be methodical enough to beat the, the Houston, the super small lineup with Robert Covington as the center, I believe. I think that they can pull out games while Westbrook is out. I think they better win the games while Russell Westbrook is out because I think once he comes back, absolutely they're not going to win. Uh, you know, Chris Paul, point god, obviously, uh, he's been putting up great numbers all season and just leading that team to win after win, which has really, really impressed me. Um, and this series, I think, overall is going to be pretty exciting because you're going to see those uh, methodical half-court sets that the Thunder like to run. And I think you're going to see it win them uh, a few games. But um, once Westbrook comes back, I just think there's too much. Uh, you know, Steven Adams, there's obviously uh, the size advantage there but you know how many post-ups do you see steven adams get a game uh probably probably zero uh he's just not that type of player and so i think i think that harden's gonna gonna tear him up because he honestly who can stop james harden i haven't seen anybody do it yet uh my only question is while westbrook's out harden's probably going to be playing 44 minutes a game, and then I wonder about the next round uh, if they get there, um, because that seems to be the trend the past at least couple of seasons with James Harden is playing these huge minutes, and then he tends to fizzle out as it gets second, third round. So I think that the... I just think that what the Rockets are running, I don't think the Thunder can stop. Um, again, I think that they'll pull out probably three games. I think they're going to make it tough on them, that's for sure. Um, I think it's going to be exciting to uh, to see them trying to make it tough on them. But I think at, you're, you asked the question earlier, can Harden uh, carry the load without Westbrook? And I think the answer is absolutely, uh, because he's used to it. He's absolutely used to doing it. He's done it for several playoff series in a row. Um, so I think absolutely he can carry the Rockets without Russell Westbrook. Yeah, then when Russell Westbrook comes back, uh, I think it's going to be a nightmare for the Thunder. Yeah, Aaron, you mentioned a couple points that I wanted to bring up. Uh, the first was Harden's minutes. Uh, probably going to play high fours until Westbrook comes back. But with the bubble, he did get you know three, four months of you know rest, to kind of get rid of that fatigue, you know, of the of the, of the long season before that. 
uh, with all that rest, Kevin does Harden. Do you see Harden uh, keeping up his you know his pace in those minutes for, throughout the playoffs? Um, I think if Westbrook comes back and takes a load off of him, I, I think he has a good shot of doing it. I think that's the reason they brought in Westbrook in the first place was kind of to make it easier for him when they go deeper in the playoffs. Uh, the problem with it is, in my opinion, that like when you play this iso ball style, when it, it's like game to game, it's fine in the regular season, but in the playoffs when teams can really, you know, form a defensive strategy and play a certain way and they start to pick up your tendencies, stuff like that, it becomes harder and harder to do it. I think that's what the what, I think that's why Harden ends up struggling when he gets to like the later rounds of the playoffs. Not necessarily because he gets tired. I'm sure he does get tired, but more so because teams are more used to guarding him. Um, and, you know, it's not so much of a surprise when he, you know, when he steps back and shoots the uh, step back jumper or when he does, uh, or those little tricks that he does to draw fouls don't really work as well. So, uh, I mean, I'm sure they'll have, I'm sure they have a plan going forward for it, but I don't know. We'll see. I don't, I personally just don't think Harden's. Play style that can do playoff success. And I guess one point I want to bring up is uh, Aaron. You mentioned it. Stephen Adams. I think he can be the X factor in this series. Uh, does he? I guess have. It depends. Does, does he have the speed to keep up with the Rockets' small ball lineup? I think if he can stay out there, and not be a liability if he's guarding you know, Covington or you know or whoever else the Rockets want to throw out at uh, at center, I think he can dominate the boards. Uh, against a small lineup and he can really help uh, the Thunder slow down the pace and keep, you know, keep the Rockets from running and hopefully keep it out of Harden's hands, uh, keep the ball out of Harden's hands as much as possible. Uh, that being said, I'm still going Rockets in seven. I think uh, Harden uh, is just, like uh, like both you guys have said, too much for Oklahoma to guard. Uh, when, Res- when Westbrook comes back, I think that just adds a whole other dimension that I don't think OKC can stop uh, despite the... Uh, the great season they've had, a supposedly tanking team finishing as the fifth seed. Uh, it's been a great story, but I think the Rockets do take it. I give them seven games, though. Uh, Aaron, what, what's your prediction for this? I think the Thunder are going to push it out to seven games, but I have the Rockets Rockets in seven uh, because I think Harden Harden's going to win them several games, and then when Westbrook comes back, they just aren't going to be able to, to do it. Um, I think the Thunder have some have some great pieces. Um, SGA has been fantastic this season, and I'm really hoping that he's going to turn into a big future piece with that franchise. But I just don't think that they have the defensive ability. Um, like you said, I think that Steven Adams is going to – he's, he's going to grind it out. He's always going to grind out every single game he's playing, whether he's uh, guarding Boban or whether he's guarding you know, P.J. Tucker. Uh, do I think he can stop anybody shooting from in the corners? No, but the Rockets, you know, with their small ball lineup, they surrender just a ton of offensive rebounds uh, to teams that aren't great offensive rebounders. So I think with Steven Adams, he's going to have several games where, you know, he's grabbing eight, nine, ten offensive rebounds uh, simply because there's not anybody that can he's seven feet tall and PJ Tucker I think is six five and uh, he's gonna he's gonna help win them some games with Chris Paul and I think uh, SGA is gonna help win them some games as well I think he's to me he's their X factor um, Gilgis Alexander I think he's their X factor but Rockets in seven just because you can't you can't stop Harden. Uh, I like all the Canadians we're talking about here. Shai Gilgis, Alexander, Jamal Murray. It's a good sign uh, for Canada to disappoint me once again when they fail to make the Olympics. Uh, Kevin, what's your prediction for this series? Um, I've got Rockets in six. I think the problem with this series, I think the Thunder or the Rockets just aren't a great matchup for the Thunder. Uh, the Thunder kind of play small ball with those three guards out there and Danilo Gallinari at the four. And I think the Rockets are better at them at playing small. So I think, you know, if you're not going to punish them by going big and you're just going to try and play small, it's going to end up with the Rockets winning. Um, Multitude of factors, but mainly because I think their offensive talent is a little bit better. 
All right. Uh, so once again, we agree on who's winning the series, all three of us. Uh, so that all, uh, all eight series, we've agreed who's going to win and all the higher seeds we have going through. Um, we're not going to go through all the, the entire playoffs, but Aaron, as the, uh, the guest on the show here, who, what is your prediction? Who are the two finals uh, participants and who takes the, uh, the Larry OB home? I've got the Clippers and the Bucks, and unfortunately for Giannis Antetokounmpo, whom I think is awesome, I think Clippers, uh, Clippers take it. That's my prediction for the whole thing. Oh, um, Kawhi giving Giannis nightmares again. Yeah, absolutely he's going to. And with PG-13 as a sidekick, uh, I just think it's going to be a nightmare. Um, that's one of the teams that I think really can slow Giannis down. Um, I think Giannis is going to be slowed down by a couple of these teams in the East, uh, particularly the Raptors with their size. They're going to form that Giannis wall and make other players beat them. Uh, ultimately, I think they get past that and get to the finals. But the Clippers, it's just you have Kawhi Leonard, you have Paul George. Both of those guys can and will score 30 a night. Um, their defense is, you know, all NBA level, both of them. And I'm just not sure that the Bucks. I think that somebody else on the Bucks besides Giannis is going to have to win it for them. And I don't think that Eric Bledsoe is that player. And um, I just, I don't know. I don't think that they have, I don't think that they have enough. I don't think this is going to be their year. I love their team. Love Giannis. I just think that the Clippers are just too loaded. You have two All NBA players, two All NBA defenders, and you have all their surrounding pieces. I think that they're just going to be able to to will themselves to to a ring this year. And I'm not. If that ends up happening, I'm not unhappy with that. Um, I think Kawhi's a great player. I think Paul George is a great player. Love Montrez Harrell. I love that Joakim Noah's on that team. Uh, Patrick Beverly's not my favorite player to watch, but boy, is he a pest. Um, and if that ends up being the final series, I think it'll be exciting as hell. I mean, I'll watch every single one of those games for sure. But that's my prediction. I think Clippers. All right, so Aaron's got the Clippers over the Bucks. Uh, Kevin, who you have in the finals? I've got Bucks over Clippers, um, probably in seven. Uh, I think just at the end of the day, I think continuity in basketball means something. And I think Clippers are trying to fit a lot, of, a lot of pieces together that haven't played together. I have, the, I think they have a lot of their role players do not have the mindset of role players. If you don't understand what I mean, I'm like Reggie Jackson. Definitely thinks he's the best player on the floor every time he steps out there. Uh, Marquise Morris, or do they have Marcus? I forgot which one they have. I think it's but, Marcus. I think they have Marcus. Yeah, they have the one who was on the Celtics. Like he doesn't think of himself as a role player for sure. Um, like the thing, the thing with the Raptors last year was that everyone knew their role so well, and they played really well around Kawhi. I don't think that's the case for the Clippers. And I, again, the Bucks have just, you know, they've been running the same system for like two, three years now. Everyone kind of has settled into their roles. Um, uh, yeah, Middleton is definitely not the. You know the number two that Paul George is, but he's pretty damn good, and their defense is you know, elite level defense. So I think if Giannis can you know string together some decent shooting games, that would be helpful. But ultimately, I do think they have enough to, to get it done. I hope right. they do. Honestly, I hope I hope that they do. Um, yeah, this I really is, do love this Giannis. Is first things for me, like I'm hoping the Bucks don't win and Giannis asks out and then goes to the <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we we went through this already. He's going to the Raptors because they're about to win their second straight championship. Um, I'm going to go with the homer pick here. I'm going to go Raptors over Clippers. Uh, I had real no real argument, but then Kevin brought up continuity, which the Raptors have. Uh, these guys have been playing together since the G League, like Siakam, Van Vliet. All these guys have been playing together for so long. Uh, Nick Nurse should have been coach of the year. Uh, should be coach Agreed. of the year. Agreed. Um. He here, here. Yeah, I don't understand why he's not. I think the Raptors, their defense uh, is just going to be there. They've done it to Giannis once. I know they don't have Kawhi anymore, but 
Uh, team defense can carry it. I think they can give Milwaukee shooters enough trouble to get past them in the East. And then, you know, in the West, they'll show Kawhi why he should have stayed in Toronto. I'm, I'm not bitter. Not at all. <laughs> not even a little bit. I'm actually not. Like, he, he I, I said when he, <laughs> when he first got traded here, if he wins a championship, he can do whatever he wants. And he did. So, not bitter. We'll have the title. But I think uh, Raptors over Clippers in seven. And, uh, yeah, that's, that, that'll be fun. And then Giannis comes to Toronto, not Golden State. So, Kevin can, I, I'd be, good with that. Kevin can be sad again. No, Gian- Giannis wouldn't join a, you know, he wouldn't front run like that. A two-time champion? No, yeah, I it's, think, it's not, totally not front running to go to the Warriors. Not at all. Yeah. I think that Giannis is coming to the Chicago Bulls. That's, uh, that's, I know that's what everybody's predicting. Giannis doesn't want that. No. <laughs> <laughs> there was no sarcasm there at all. Objectively, that would actually be a real bad team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure Gian- right. Giannis and Levine would actually just be a real bad team, like objectively. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it'd be pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, they'd both they'd both be driving into the same lane every single time. Yep. I'm watching this Dallas game. I need Giannis to force his way to Dallas. That would be, that would be something. Can you imagine Luca, Porzingis, and Giannis? Good gracious. Yeah, Giannis can't shoot. He doesn't fit on the Mavs. That's fine. <laughs> he doesn't. He can't shoot. He doesn't fit. Everybody else can shoot. Let him play center. I'd put him at center. And Porzingis seems to. My one. That's my one gripe with Porzingis is that the guy is, I don't know, seven foot eleven inches, and he avoids contact like the plague. Uh, Aaron but soft European stereotype back. He just doesn't <laughs> want to tear his ACL again. He was. He had like the longest ACL recovery I've ever seen in a player, and he just doesn't want to do it again. That's fine. Over Marcus Moore. <laughs> Marcus Morris. I, I would be if Giannis went to the Mavericks. I may piss my pants. Like I would be excited enough to, you know, to soil myself. So <laughs> <laughs> it's and it's neutral enough that I won't be mad. You know, <laughs> you should be mad. They'd win the next twelve championships. Yeah, they would. <laughs> well, whatever, man. It's fine. I yeah. guess we'll see, won't the, we? The, War- the Warriors are already getting the first overall pick. Let's not get greedy with them, all right? You mean the Bucks are? All right. Yeah, I've got a, uh, I walked into that one, damn. I've got a fantasy six-pack preview on the Warriors coming out in the next couple of days. Uh, starting out with Steph Curry. I was going to be doing a uh, Warriors, the entire team. But after I had written, I don't know, several pages just on Steph Curry himself, uh, I thought that maybe I might do it player by player. So check that out on a fantasy six pack in the next couple of days. It'll be up after it's well and thoroughly edited. All right. Well, that seems like a good place to uh, to end off. Nice, nice plug there. Uh, Aaron, where can the uh, fans find you, our newest uh, fantasy six pack writer on uh, on Twitter? On Twitter, my handle is Nebby K Nezer, uh, like King Nebuchadnezzar, except N E B B Y. Capital K N E Z Z E R, and follow me. Feel free to at me if you don't like something. I'd love to talk about it. I'd love to hear some uh, perspectives and opinions, and uh, some angry people who disagree, and some happy people who agree. So uh, feel free to at me on on Twitter. All right, and Kevin, where can uh, I'll show most people listening to this know where to find you already? But uh, what is your Twitter handle? Yeah, at Kevin M H U O. I I tweet a lot of gifts. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, same. Uh, that's all I can contribute to Twitter at this point. Elite, <laughs> elite, elite. Yes, elite, top tier. You're uh, max money. That's a max contract gift usage. I, I'm an up and comer on the Luka Doncic gift <laughs> uh, usage. You I, find me. Uh, sorry, Aaron. Go ahead. If I sent y'all all the gifts that I share on Facebook. And the memes that I share on Facebook, if I shared those all on Twitter, you'd all block me immediately. <laughs> well, don't tell people that. No, they're not going to follow you. <laughs> um, you find me, Jonathan, at jchan underscore 811. Uh, like Aaron said, come argue with me. I mean, I've gotten enough of that today from Josh Allen fans as it is. Uh, so you don't have to. I just have bad photoshops and 
dumb jokes about me burning my eyes with breath mints this morning in underneath my mask, which is cool. <laughs> um, that was real bad. I can't believe I didn't realize, you know, five months into a pandemic that if you have a mask on, don't have gum or breath mints because it will go into your eyes. It was real painful. It's good to know. I haven't you know, tried that out yet. So, uh, I'm yeah, really, I'm glad that you uh, were the guinea pig. Took the bullet on that one. There. Yeah, thank you. Thank Do you. Do not recommend. All right, uh, everyone, thanks for listening uh, to the John and Hull Show with our special guest, Aaron Gruber. And uh, I guess we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.